Welcome to Newark UPC's Memorable Moments. This segment features past messages that really challenged us and called us higher. We invite you to not only remember where we have been, but what God has called us to, and to realize that God is taking us forward. May these messages inspire you to be faithful to God's plan. Praise the Lord. I tell you, it's especially good to see y'all this morning. When you've been away for a minute, it's like home, sweet home. <laughs> it really is. Why don't you stand with me this morning? And we lift our hands and our voices. Let's welcome God into this place. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. And we thank you, God, for the privilege of being in your midst and amongst your people this day. We worship you, Lord. And we glorify you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless your holy name. Praise you, Jesus. Come on and sing with me this morning. we would be in. No hope, no healing, no salvation. That's a dark thought. But he has come. Right? That's the good news. 
And because he's come, we do have the hope of salvation. We do have the hope of healing. We do have the hope uh, that life can be better. We do have the promise of heaven because he came. He's an awesome God. And we sing some of these songs sometimes, and we get to, you know, we hear them all the time. And then, our Messiah has come. Do you know there's a whole ginormous group of people who don't know that? You know, what we take for granted, they don't know that. There's some, some folks that know of a coming, and he's come and gone and about to come again, and they still missed it, right? It's a privilege to know that our Messiah has come and that his name is Jesus. He's an awesome God. Praise you, Jesus. If you have a need this morning, that Messiah is listening. That Messiah is waiting to hear you. That Messiah is waiting to move on your behalf. If you have a particular need that you like prayer for this morning, you can come on up and just stretch out across this altar here. And the ministerial staff will come and pray with you. Um, if you have a, a, a special unspoken, I call it, you know, you don't even want to put it out there. Perhaps it's very hard to articulate, but it's on your heart. Something, you know, we're going to agree together, right? You have a look around, because I know all of you, even though you haven't come here, Everybody has a need. If you don't have a need, I don't know what kind of bubble you're living in, but then pray for somebody else who does, right? But we're going to form that web of agreement. We're going to take our needs to him this morning because our Messiah is able. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. God, that we can come to you, Lord, in confidence, knowing that you can minister to every need, those both great and small. God, we're asking you that you would touch those this morning with terminal illnesses, Jesus, and chronic illnesses, and those with dire outcomes that have been projected of God. God, we, we know that you're the ultimate physician. We're going to believe only you, Jesus. And God, we ask that you would minister your healing and your divine intervention, O oh God, to our children, O oh God, our wayward children who are lost in this world. We're lifting them up before you this morning, Jesus, asking you, God, to give them a heart that desires you above all things, to do a mighty work in their hearts, O oh God, to draw them to you, Lord, by the power of your anointing, O oh Jesus. Keep them, oh God. Bring them to that place where they can hear you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we're lifting up our children before you this morning. Oh God, every other need, God, we agree together in your name this morning, Jesus, for healing and salvation, for deliverance, for clarity, oh God, for understanding, Jesus. God, we know that your spirit can do all things, God. We yield to you this morning. And, oh God, in this service today, you know what your people need, Lord Jesus. Minister, God, in a very personal way to each and every one of us, Lord Jesus. Cause us, God, to leave here. Uh, changed, hopeful, uh, healed, whatever it is that you want to do, God. We put no limitations on you this morning, Jesus. Oh, we believe that you can do all things, Jesus, and we trust you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you thank him in advance? Why don't you go ahead and just thank him for what he's done? Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We believe you this morning, Jesus. Yeah, Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Praise your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. You can remain seat, uh, standing. In fact, get out of your pews and greet each other in the name of the Lord this morning. Praise the Lord. There we go. Thank God for his goodness to us. I got up this morning and said, this is the day that the Lord has made. And it looks like he did another good job. I want to talk to you just a few moments this morning in our just a thought. On just pay the ransom. Just pay the ransom uh, I was joking with Nick before service that we don't negotiate with terrorists just go ahead and pay the ransom <laughs> and he told me that's not the way that works <laughs> that's not what that means but let's look at the scripture Matthew 20 and 28 it's also found in Mark 10 and 45 even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So in, in case you may miss last week, Regina talked about healing and this uh, session, our small groups are on healing 
so she was tying in there. I'm going to go back a little bit and talk about the Redeemer. He ransomed us. He bought us back. And so I want to do this with a very simple story that I learned in Sunday school, oh, way more than 60 years ago. And since it's been so long, I may not remember all of the minute details, so please cut me a little slack on this one. But I want to tell you a story, and uh, it was a story of a boy who went into, and there he found all these different tools and uh, took them, the the chisels, the uh, saws, hammers, the paints and paint brushes, and he, in his, uh, you know, and, and kids can sometimes do things because they've got the time and, and they can take the effort, and, and if you ever taught fifth grade, you know that you need to be an expert in everything if you are in a fifth grade teacher. Someone in the class who knows all about rocks and someone else who knows all about dinosaurs and someone who is so uh, meticulous about the weather. So little boys can do things uh, many times. And, and so he made himself a model ship, a boat that he uh, could make. And, and uh, this is not the picture of it, but it's a representation and he liked to, not only he, did he make the boat, but he made it not just for display, but he made it to use. It was a boat that he could take out and take to the stream, and, and there he could sail the boat and maybe uh, use a, a, a stick or a limb and, and, and guide it along. And, and just as boys will do, just play with the boat at the water. But one day, for some reason, the boat seemed to get away from him, and it got out of his reach, and it got pulled into the current, and, and before he knew what was happening, the boat was in a faster part of the stream, and, and away it went through places that he, he just couldn't catch up with it, and so he lost his boat. So many hours he had spent working on that boat, getting it just right. So many more hours he had spent in, in enjoyment of that boat. But now it was gone. It had been taken from him by the forces of nature. One day he was downtown, and he happened to be passing by a thrift shop a second-hand store. And there in the window of that thrift shop, on display with a price tag marked on it, was his boat. Someone had found it. And someone, whoever found it, however many trades were involved, it wound up in the second-hand store. It wound up in the thrift shop with a price on it. Somebody was willing, the proprietor of the store, consignment, whatever it was, was willing to sell the boat for this price. The little boy noticed the price and rushed home, got a hammer, one of those that he had used to make the boat, got his piggy bank and broke it got his coins together, ran back downtown and ran into the store and purchased the boat. And as he walked out of the store holding the boat close, he said, you are mine. You are mine because I made you. You. 
and you are mine because I bought you. And 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6 tells us that we're talking about the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. And when the Lord saw us in the second-hand store, he decided, I'll just pay the ransom. And that's just a thought. Aren't you glad he did? Will you stand with me? It's time to receive your offering. If our ushers would come and you would prepare to give. If you are a first time guest with us or if you come again, welcome. Uh, it is a blessing to have you in our midst. Uh, we do have a first time guest reception right behind this wall here to my right. Uh, if you'd like to share uh, a little time with us following service. Uh, meet some of the ministerial staff, stash some refreshments, um, you know, as little or as long as you like. It's all about you. Uh, please, please do so following the service. All right, let's ask the Lord to bless this offering. Jesus, we thank you for your many, many blessings, Jesus, those seen and unseen. God, we give back some of that which you have given to us. Bless it and multiply it and use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Please.
Hallelujah. Praise your name. Hallelujah. You gonna lift his name on high with me?
thank you, Lord. We stand here today, no matter what our circumstances, and we declare it is well with our souls. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. We worship you open and freely today just because you deserve it. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Can we take a moment longer before we go any farther and just simply thank him? Because no matter what our circumstances are, it is well with our souls. He has, he paid the ransom. And we can stand here today and say, thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Yes, Lord, we love you. Hallelujah, we exalt you and worship you today. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Unto you be all glory, honor, dominion, and power, majesty forever and evermore. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah, we worship you today just because you deserve it. We exalt you today because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And it flows out of us, out of a deep place, because you have been so good to us and we are so thankful and grateful. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is such a gift. It is a privilege to be able to come into the house of God and to sing and exalt his name. We have it so, so good, my brothers and sisters. And many times we don't, we don't even realize how good we have it. Aren't you thankful, though, that you can come together this morning? Aren't you glad we're here in God's presence? Do you feel him right now? Amen. Amen. If you are a guest with us, we are delighted that you are here. And we'd be happy to meet you after service if you have a few minutes. But we just want to welcome you once again. And we are glad that you are with us and to our church family. We were gone last week, we being my family, the Lugos, but we are happy to be back. I am glad to be with my church family today. It is a good day to come to the house of God. It is a good day to worship Him. And no matter what the circumstances are, it is well with our soul. Amen. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Margo. You can go ahead and be seated. I have kind of a, a question for you as, as we begin today. Sometimes in our life, we're facing circumstances. We're not sure what's going on. We got to figure out what's next. And have you ever prayed and felt very clear direction from God? God has spoken to you in some way, whether it was through the preaching or you're reading the word or you were in a time of prayer and God said, do this in this situation. And isn't that a great comfort? Aren't you glad? Because then you can rest assured this is where I am supposed to be. And we lean on those times. And we go back to those times. And it's important to us. But here's the reality. There's probably just as many times where we don't get that kind of direction. How many of you are facing circumstances you don't even have to raise your hand right now where you're thinking, God, what am I supposed to be doing in this right now? I, I don't know where to go, how I'm supposed to handle this. What am I to do? We sang this song. I didn't know what we were singing today, but this song, It Is Well With Our Soul. It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, if you don't know the history of that song, look it up later. I won't give you all the details, but the short version is the man who wrote that song wrote it after his children drowned in a shipwreck. And yet he was able to still write that from the depths of his heart. And sometimes in deep pain, Sometimes maybe it's not deep pain, it's just total loss and we're not sure where to go and what to do yet. God is still with us. And even when he's not speaking, what do you do when you don't have that clear direction? I know I'm starting super excited today. <laughs> where do we go 
when we're not sure what to do yet. I was praying this morning and seeking God for direction. And I was asking him about this myself. And I felt the Lord speak to me. And for a few minutes, if you'll stay with me, I just want to talk about this idea. Do what you know to do. Radical concept, right? I know. Brilliant. You're just astounded by my depth today. But do what you know to do. When we look through the scriptures, we see God showing up in miraculous ways. We see God giving incredible direction. I think of Gideon in Judges and how God appears to him multiple times and assures him that he is supposed to lead the nation of Israel out of their captivity and he's going to give him very specific direction and God shows up repeatedly to him. I think of Moses. I was just reading this in my own devotion time earlier this week once again and how God speaks to Moses and he shows up miraculously in this burning bush and then he does miracle after miracle and sign after sign. And God walks with him for the next 40 years as he leads the nation of Israel out of their exodus from Egypt. As they wander through the wilderness and as they get ready to come into that promised land. And God shows up time and time again. But there are other examples in the scripture where it's probably more like, where are you God? What is, what is going on right now? What are you doing? And one of those examples... I think that is worth looking at again is the life of Joseph. Now we probably all know the story of Joseph or at least most of you do and we tend to look at the end and it ends very, very well for Joseph. But there's a whole lot of empty space in the middle where things are not going all that well. The story starts when he's 17 years old. God has given him some incredible dreams about the future, high, lofty dreams and his brother's response is to sell him into slavery. It takes 13 years from the time of those dreams until the time that Joseph is put in charge in Egypt. It takes another nine years beyond that before he sees his brothers again. So understand from the start of that story until the fulfillment of those dreams, there's a 22-year gap. Now in your Bible, it takes like four chapters. Okay? So it doesn't seem that long. But understand, there's a 22-year gap from the 17-year-old boy who God says, I'm going to put you in charge, to the 39-year-old man who finally sees something like this come to pass. What do we do in the in-between time? What does Joseph do? We see that God gives him these dreams and gives him clear direction in the sense that someday you will reach this. But if you go back and you read that story, we see that Joseph was faithful. We see that God gave him favor. But we don't see a whole lot of direction in the 22 years between the dreams that come to a 17-year-old and the 39-year-old man who finally has his brothers bowing down before him and he sees the fulfillment of those dreams. Let's look at just a few select passages out of there. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn with me or you can look up on the screen. We'll start in Genesis 39. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And this pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. And all his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and his livestock flourished. And so Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Doesn't that sound nice for Potiphar? <laughs> Keep in mind that 17-year-old boy is a slave who's been dragged from his homeland, separated from his family, and is now having to work in a foreign land. It says God gave him favor, but what was Joseph doing? Joseph's working. There's no great super high spiritual thing going on here. 
The implication is he starts out in the fields. He's doing manual labor. And he does well at it. And so he's given some responsibility for things. And he does well at it. And so he's given more responsibility. And the responsibility keeps growing for Joseph until finally Joseph is in charge of everything in Potiphar's household. Now again, that part sounds good, but do you understand this means that Joseph worked nonstop? There's no days off for Joseph. Joseph is a slave. He's owned by Potiphar. Joseph is good at what he does, and so the response is, give him more to do. Joseph excels at what he does, so the response is, let's give him more work. And it keeps piling on. And Joseph continues to do what he knows to do. Now, I'm reading a little bit between the lines, but understand that Joseph came from a large family. His father was a herdsman. His father has 12 sons. They have children. They have livestock and all kinds of wealth. So it's not like Joseph grew up in a vacuum. The boy knew how to work. The boy knew how to be out in a field. He knew how to take care of animals. He had to have some administrative ability before he came because he knew how to organize things and take care of what was going on and keep things moving. Jacob not only has 12 sons, but he has servants himself. So Joseph comes from a working background. And he comes from a place where there are lots of moving parts, if you will, and lots of things going on. And he shows up in this environment. He's been kidnapped. Another term would be shanghai He's been forced into labor that he did not expect. Now he's a slave in a foreign land. And where are you, God? And Joseph's response is to do what he knew to do. Go back to work. I don't know where God is. I don't know what's going on in my situation. And this looks really low right now. So I'm going to pick up my tools and I'm going to go back to work. And God blesses him and he prospers. But then, when it's finally looking maybe a little bit better for Joseph, as we know the story, it turns again. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. He refuses to cooperate. And so for Joseph's honor and character, he gets the privilege of being thrown in jail for doing what's right. But even in that circumstance, we can jump forward down to verse 19. Potiphar was furious when he had learned his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. And so he took Joseph and he threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. So once again, things start to climb up and then they crash and now Joseph is back in prison. Where are you, God? What am I supposed to do in this circumstance? Go back to work. It's not like he had a choice. He's in prison. He's going to work. So do what you know to do. And Joseph begins to work once again. And it says the Lord was with him. And the Lord gave him favor. But what we don't read in the story is God saying, it's okay, Joseph. You're only going to be here a few years. And then I'm going to make you the second man in charge. No, what we get is, I'm still with you. God, why is this happening to me? What am I supposed to be doing right now? And I personally think that's the response he got. What am I supposed to be doing right now? Nothing. So what does Joseph do? He does what he knows to do. He goes back to work. And God was with him. Get this. He's in a negative situation that is not his fault, that he has no control over, that he cannot change and so he just goes back to work. And God looks at that and says, I'm pleased with that. And God gives him favor. And once again, he ends up back in charge. He's still in prison. It's not like he can leave. 
He doesn't have any options, can't go anywhere, but at least in his current circumstance, he's doing what he knows to do, and he's working, and God gives him favor once again. Two men show up in the prison, you know the story. Cupbearer and a baker. He interprets their dreams. One of them is executed, the other is restored to a place of honor. He says, don't forget me. When you get to your place, you, you tell the king. Cupbearer is restored. And two years go by. Nothing. And Joseph is still just working. How long is your memory? How patient are you with people? If someone's going to do you a favor, if someone's going to help you out with something, if, if you asked your neighbor or someone to come over and help you with a backyard project, and they said, yeah, I'm going to get to that soon. <laughs> would you be still looking at your Saturdays two years later going, they're going to show up any day now. <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> we're going to build that deck soon. No, you long ago would have been done with this circumstance. It's been two years since that man said, I'm going to remember you, Joseph. Joseph knows that he has been forgotten about. And now we're stuck once again. Where are you, God? And it's silent. I don't know what to do in this circumstance. This isn't even my fault. I didn't create this. I didn't do anything wrong. Keep working. That's real encouraging right now, isn't it? <laughs> Keep working. Do what you know to do. Now the story does get better. We can read just a little bit later. We're jumping down to chapter 41. After Joseph has interpreted this dream for Pharaoh, it says Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. And so Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this? A man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. Now this is starting to sound good, isn't it? It's only been 13 years in the making. It only took 13 years of slavery in prison. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a rank higher than yours. So now we get to the good parts version, right? Now, now we get to the part we like in Joseph's story where he is restored and he is put in a place of honor and the king of Egypt looks at this slave, this foreigner, this prisoner, and says, clearly God is with you and you're highly intelligent and I don't think anybody could do a better job than you. So now you're in charge. You'll be second in command the only person with higher authority than you is me as king, as pharaoh. And this is the part that we like. This is the encouraging part when we look at Joseph's story. But there's been 13 years of manual labor. 13 years of slavery. 13 years of work plus a prison sentence. Where are you, God? And what am I supposed to be doing in this circumstance? Keep working. Do no, do what you know to do. Keep plugging away at it. What if God never gave you direction for your life again? Now, that doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? Can we, my brothers and sisters, live a life faithful to what God has called us based on what he's already told us? There are times, and this is where I'm headed with this. It doesn't take very long to get here. Speaking this morning, there is someone, if not several of you here, and I don't know who and it doesn't matter, but you're facing a circumstance right now. Probably not even of your own making. And you've been asking God for direction. And saying, what is here? God, this doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. And now I'm stuck. 
and I don't know what to do next. Please, God, give me direction. And you're getting a heavenly chorus of silence. That celestial orchestra is on intermission in your life right now. You're going, what is this? So I come here today to encourage some of you and give you a little direction as you've been asking God. But it's not the kind of direction you may have been expecting. It's just simply do what you know to do. Give you an example from my own life this morning. I knew that I was preaching this morning. That's no secret. It's been published to the pastoral staff for several weeks now. And so leading up to this weekend, thinking about it. And sometimes, let me, let me just let some of you in on the life of, of preaching. Um, sometimes God speaks to you very clearly. And he says, say this and go here. And these are the scriptures I want you to use. And it just flows out of you. And you are just so thrilled to be used by God that way am I right and then there are other times where you got to kind of grind it out and it just takes a while and then there are other times where it's Saturday night at 11 o'clock and I have been praying and I've been asking God and I have several sermons that I took notes on and I thought this will be really good some other time because it is not going to fit tomorrow <laughs> and so I take some basic out I'm just being real take some basic outlines and file them on my computer and think I'll come back to that someday, but not tomorrow morning. And so, get up this morning, and I'm saying, God, church is getting ready to start. I'd really, really like it if you'd tell me where we're going this morning. I really don't want to get up there by myself. Please give me some direction. And there's nothing really spiritual right now, don't I? And so I pray, and I read more, and I continue praying. And finally, out of desperation, I say to God, give me some direction, something, give me a thought. I will take just a thought at this point. <laughs> I will start with just a thought, and we can go from there. And then the Lord very clearly spoke to me, and he said, I'll put it up there because somebody needs to hear this. In the absence of clear direction, do what you know to do. I thought, okay, I'll do what I know to do. It's Sunday morning. I should preach the gospel. And he said, no, that's, that's the message. I just told you. <laughs> that's it. It doesn't have to be incredible. And that's my point and the reason I share this with you. The clouds don't have to part. There doesn't have to be a burning bush experience. And if you have those, wonderful. But sometimes God speaks very simply and many times in our Christian walk. And we don't notice this part in Scripture as much. God doesn't speak. And you haven't been forgotten. He's not angry at you. You're not being... The expectation is that you just simply do what you know to do. I have two teenage boys, and I no longer do the yard work. And I actually kind of like doing the yard work. It's a chance for me mentally to zone out a little bit and do something different. But I want to give them some opportunities to develop some skills and learn the value of labor. And I pay them a little bit for doing the yard work. You know, good stuff, right? And when my oldest son, Des, started mowing the lawn, and it was the same for Kendall earlier this summer, I was out there with him, and I told him how to crank the lawnmower and how to fill it with gas and how I wanted him to mow and to change directions and how to dump the bag, and when he was done, how to clean up the lawnmower and put it away. And I had to give him step-by-step -step instructions when he first started doing yard work. That was two years ago. Do you know what I tell Desi now? Desi, go cut the lawn. That's it. I don't need to be out there with him. I don't need to give him step-by-step -step instructions. I don't need to watch over him as he's doing it. I don't need to help him fill the gas tank. I don't need to help him clean the lawnmower when he's done. He knows what to do. 
So learn a life lesson and then apply it to our spiritual selves. Many times God gives us direction and as we grow in our walk with him, he tells us how to live a life that is pleasing to him. And then he steps back and silent for a while. I don't need to watch my son cut the lawn. God doesn't have to tell me every morning to get up and to live a righteous life, to not do things that I know are wrong. I don't need God to tell me every morning that I should probably spend some time in prayer and that I should read my Bible. These are things that I know how to do. And God's expectation is that I do what I know what to do. In the story of Joseph, he is unjustly kidnapped. He is unjustly slavery. Then, after doing the right thing, he's put in prison for not committing a crime. So he goes back to work. And God was with him. And God favored him. And some of you are facing decisions. You got a fork in the road. You're not sure what you're supposed to be doing next. And you've asked God for direction, which is good. It's right. Please, don't stop asking. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes God says, go right. Or says, go left. Or do this or do that. And sometimes God says nothing. That's just part of our faith walk with him. You didn't do something wrong. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. And in the absence of clear direction, do what you know to do. When God has not told you the next step, do what you know is right. Continue to be faithful in what you know to do. Asking God about the next step in your spiritual walk where you should be going, what it is you should be doing next. Maybe it's not a job direction thing or something like that. You just, God, I need more of you or I want more of you in my life. I need direction for, for my life. And God hasn't given you some glorious plan yet. You just do what you know to do. Like Joseph, can we be faithful and just simply work even when we have no idea where it's going. It's great to read about Joseph being made second in command over Egypt, but there's a 13-year period where Joseph lived in a where-are-you-God kind of state. And he just worked, and he just worked, and he just did what he knew was right. And musicians, if you want to come, as I said, this is nothing super complicated this morning, and that's deliberate. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes God's lack, sometimes not hearing some incredible direction from him is God's invitation for us just to simply walk in what we know to do. And as you stand with me, I encourage all of us today we're going to spend just a little bit of time in prayer before we close this out. And we're going to ask God that he would continue to speak to us. But then we're also going to ask ourselves, what do I know that I should be doing right now? Yes, we know to live a righteous life. Yes, we know to live a life that's pleasing to God. But is there something that God has asked you to do earlier that you should be continuing in right now? You're waiting for that next step and God's simply expecting you at the moment to continue doing what he already asked. I'd encourage you to spend a little time in prayer, whether that's in your pews or if you want to come down and pray. But can we take a few minutes before we close out today and just ask once again to speak to us and in the absence of clear direction, encourage us and I pray today you'd recognize whoever needed to hear this that sometimes he asks us just to do what we know to do. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that your spirit gives us incredible examples of people that you spoke to and gave clear direction, but I'm also thankful, Lord, for the low points. Stories like in Joseph's where there are years without clear direction. 
And yet we see these examples of people who just work and they just simply do what's right. They do what they know to do. And I pray that you would speak to us today as a congregation and that you'd encourage us. And even in the absence of clear direction, that we would be able to look within ourselves. We recognize we need to do what we know to do. Help us to be faithful in what you have already given us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Can you spend a little time in prayer today? So we talk to God.
at the end of Joseph's story. This is after Jacob has passed away. This is shortly before Joseph is going to die. His older brothers realize, Dad's gone now. We don't have Daddy's protection. And Joseph is a powerful man in this nation, and we now live here as foreigners at his good mercies. And so they send message to their brother, basically begging him not to kill them, not to execute them, not to do something terrible for what they deserve. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, Joseph replied, Don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended harm for me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. And he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Joseph in his 80s has a very different perspective than Joseph at 17. But he couldn't get that until he had gone through it. He couldn't stand in that place until after all of these things had happened to him. And somewhere in the process of just simply doing what he knew to do, he learned a few more things. And God continued to bless him and continued to guide him. And I encourage you today, when you face uncertainty, when you face a time of not knowing what's next, when you're staring at the void, and sometimes it feels like that, and God is not answering back, And heaven's on intermission. Just do what you know to do. God bless you. Have a good day.